So what we're going to cover today to start off with is an overview of Java synchronized and concurrent collections. And you'll see as we get a little further along why it is we're covering these topics right now. So uh, essentially, I'll give you an overview of what synchronized and concurrent collections mean in Java. They're very useful. You don't always have to use them. There's other things you can do, but they turn out to be a big boost, especially if you're running on multi-core programs and really want to maximize the uh, potential concurrency by minimizing contention for locks. We'll start out with the synchronized collections first. So by, by default, Java collections are not synchronized. And uh, what the heck does that mean for the, the things not to be synchronized? Well, what it means is that uh, it means that if you run them in multiple threads, you're going to have problems. What are the problems you're going to have? You're going to have problems with the classic, all the classic concurrency problems. Things are not properly protected from race conditions and visibility issues and so on and so forth. And in particular, they're not thread safe. So if one thread makes a change, then another thread either might uh, not see that change because of memory visibility delays, which are built into the Java memory model. Or you may have race conditions where things are not accessed in any kind of protected way so the state can get corrupted. Yes, Cole. What are we talking about? Collections. Well, here's a good one. Does that look familiar? So array list, link list, hash map, those are all the examples of collections. Java provides a whole bunch of wrappers, or, or really the word decorator is a better term, decorators that are used to wrap or decorate built-in collections with synchronization wrappers. So here's the one, here are the factory methods that create these decorators. And um, what these do is they ensure that method calls on the collections are thread safe. So here's an example. We've got a hash map. And then we want to set and get, or put and get, elements into the hash map. But we want to make sure we do it in a way that won't end up with corrupted data, where the hash map will be, uh, internal state will be corrupted. Things, the internal hash buckets and linked lists and so on won't be all screwed up. So how do we do that? We go to the collections, static class or helper class, and it's called a utility class, collections utility class. We say synchronize map. We give it the map as a parameter. And we get back a new map. This is pretty funky, because we're giving it the old map, and then we're using the result to overwrite the old value. So we're basically decorating the old map with a synchronized decorator. And then if these different threads run concurrently, you won't have corrupted data structures. So if one thread puts a bunch of stuff into the map, and other threads are reading stuff out of the map, you'll end up with consistent views of what's happening in the map. And I'll show you why you do that in a second. So the key thing to remember, well, we'll look at the implementation details in a second, but the key thing to remember are that synchronized collections are not optimized for concurrent access. They're thread safe, but they're not optimized. Well, why is that? Well, here's what it looks like. Here's what the synchronized map factory method looks like. If you look at the collections class, you can see it's just going to take in the map and then make a new synchronized map, which is a data structure we'll see in a second. And so it basically wraps it or decorates it. Here's what this looks like. So synchronized map implements the map interface. So far, so good. It keeps a reference to the old map. So far, so good. And then it has an object called mutex. And what it does in the constructor is it goes ahead and it sets the mutex to be this. And then. And so you can see that this single mutex is going to be used by all the methods in this class in order to protect access to the underlying map. So then when someone calls a, a method like get, you can see what it does is it synchronizes on the mutex, which means there can only be one thread at a time in there. And then it forwards to the appropriate, the corresponding method on the actual map whose reference it holds. So this simply means that every time you call get on the synchronized map, it 
synchronizes, and then forwards. And that's essentially the decorator pattern from the Gang of Four book. Any questions about that? Keep that in mind. Think about how this works as we talk about the other alternatives. So this will give you thread safety, but it's not very efficient. And the reason it's not efficient is because if multiple threads are trying to access the map, they're all going to contend for a single lock. And this, this code is actually somewhat goofy in a lot of ways because, uh, I mean, I'm not sure why they wrote it like this, because they're, they're kind of having this, this mutex here, but they're assigning it to this, so they're really not getting a win. They should have just done synchronize this. It probably would have been more efficient. OK, so because of the limitations with synchronized decorators, they define, Java defines a whole pile of concurrent collections. And there's a, there's a lot of them. So they have a bunch of concurrent aware interfaces. These are some of them, like concurrent map and blocking queue. We've talked about both of those things. There's other related stuff. And then there's a bunch of classes that implement these concurrency aware interfaces. You can take a look here to see more about what this is. So the main difference between a synchronized decorator approach or a wrapper approach and a concurrent collection is that the concurrent collections are both thread safe and also optimized by not being governed by just a single mutual exclusion lock. So the synchronized wrappers, as we saw, had a single lock, whereas the, con the concurrent hash maps and other concurrent concurrency aware collections are much more optimized. And they do, of course, have synchronization. It's just typically done in a more clever way. And it's done by having these things called happens before relationships, which are often implemented under the hood by using stuff like compare and swap operations, which are super optimized to avoid blocking as much as possible. And so as a result, they can make sure that things show up in the right order, visibility is preserved at the memory level, race conditions don't occur, uh, atomicity is preserved, ordering of instructions is handled properly, blah, blah, blah. So those are just the, sort of the implementation details. The main concurrent collection I'm going to focus on here is concurrent hash map. And the reason for that is that that's your, in your next assignment. So basically, this supports concurrent retrievals and updates to the state of the map using object-oriented and functional APIs. And we'll take a look at a couple of the different examples of that in a second. And uh, my analogy for this, because I'm always trying to find a human known use that will be memorable, uh, is restrooms at, say, a, a concert or outdoor event. And so what you have is you end up having you know, lots of uh, porta potties, and each one of them has a queue of people queuing up for it. So there's not a single queue. It's not like when you go to, um, I don't know, like some international airports where you've got 15 ticket counters, but there's one line. Or actually, another good example, if you've ever gone through um, uh, security or, or uh, you know, customs at an, at an airport, where you've got a one line, and then there's a bank of customs agents that are going to ask you questions. So in that case, you have a single queue and a single lock, and then you wait till you get to the front, and they vector you off. But they're all in one big line. So in the concurrent hash map, you should think about it as being a bunch of buckets in the hash table each of which may have their own line. And as a result, you only have to lock for the line that you're in. And each line has its own lock. Now, that's not quite exactly the way it works, but it's a good way to think about it. You can also see that there's a whole bunch of methods in here, and we'll talk about a few of them in a second. So the cool thing about the concurrent hash map is it's optimized for multi-core processors. And here's sort of the history of maps in Java. And you can see that they have different properties and different performance characteristics. So for example, the classic map is the hash map, which is not thread safe. So of course, you would not use it blindly in a concurrent program unless you want your program to blow up and do strange things. So that would be an, that's sort of the, you know, the, the counterexample. Don't use a hash map in concurrent programs. Another thing you could use is a hash table which is thread safe, but it has a single lock. And so as a result, it's really slow. Um, nobody really uses hash tables anymore. Another approach would be to use the synchronized map decorator we just talked about. So 
That would be something that would decorate a hash map. And that is thread safe, but it also only has a single lock, as we just looked at, so it's not going to be very fast. And then the, the fourth approach here, which is the right one for most of the time, is the concurrent hash map. And as you can see, the, the main difference between a synchronized map and a concurrent hash map is that concurrent hash maps actually have multiple locks. Uh, sort of one for every bucket. It actually doesn't quite work out that way, but it's along those lines. And so as a result, if you're doing reads and write operations, read operations go really fast because they can all sort of run in parallel. And write operations only have to block sort of the, the bucket in which the operation is being, is, is updating something. So that way you could have multiple things writing concurrently, and as long as they're in different parts of the map, they won't contend for each other. So it's much more efficient. If you take a look at the link down here, there's a very, very detailed article written by uh, Brian Getz, who's a famous Java concurrency uh, architect. And he talks in detail about how concurrent hash map is implemented. It was implemented by my buddy Doug Lee, who's a genius at this stuff. And there's some really cool, really, really, really complicated mechanisms in there to make it work right. The good news is you don't have to worry about how the details work unless you're curious, but uh, it'll work as an end user point of view. So here are a couple of common operations that concurrent hash map supports. And they're all essentially variants of atomic check then act. So check then act, this, this is a classic example of check then act. So if the map contains a key, then put a value for that key. Put, you know, put this value for that key. That's a check then act operation. What's wrong with this code? If this was run in a concurrent program with multiple threads, what would be wrong with this? Why is check then act problematic in a concurrent program? Right, exactly. So between the point where you check to see if the key is in the map and you put the key in the map, um, it may be the case that somebody else came along and did something, like they took the key out of the map, right? So you'd be putting something in the map that didn't have a, a key. So th there's, a, there's a window in here, and so you can end up with race conditions. So one way around this is to use the replace method. This is the two-parameter version of replace. And this says, only replace the key with this value if the key is already in the map. So that's the, that's the two-parameter version of replace. Here's another variant of replace. And this is a different way of doing check the act. So this says, if the map contains the key and the current value is equal to the new value, uh, I guess I should have changed that a little bit. So if, if we get the value that's not associated with the key and it equals the new value, then put the new value into the map with that key. Well, the problem there, again, is that this, this is not atomic in any way, shape, or form. So things can be changing and chaos and insanity will ensue. So this is a much more efficient and thread safe way of doing this. So this says, if there's a key and the key has the old value, replace it with a new value. And that should look very familiar to you because that looks very, very much like compare and swap, except you're doing compare and swap if the key is in the map. If the key is not in the map, nothing will happen. If the key is in the map and it doesn't have the old value, then the new value will not be replacing the old value. Or if the, new, if the old value doesn't have the expected value, you won't do a replacement. So that's a very important operation to understand. That's one you'll need to use for your program. Here's yet another example of an atomic checked and act. And what this is doing, this is saying, if the key is null, then put the value in the map at that key. Otherwise, return the value at the key. And you can see, once again, that this logic is absolutely not thread safe. And in fact, ironically enough, even if you were to put synchronized around here, it still would potentially get you in trouble, if, if, and it would also make your code slow. Uh, and that's because get and put, the, the, you don't, the, the map doesn't lock across the get and the put. Those are two independent operations. So the way around this is to use another method, which is yet another atomic check and act method called put if absent. And what this says is, if 
the value is absent, atomically give it, sorry, if the key is absent, atomically give it this value and return the value. But if it's already there, just return the value. So that's the atomic way of doing this. So these are all examples of really cool atomic check and act methods that are added in concurrent hash map. And there's some other stuff I don't show here. I'll, I'll add that probably in the, some future version of the class. There's also something called compute if absent, where you give a lambda expression that will compute the value if the key is not already there. So that's more of a Java 8 thing, because you're actually able to give computations that can be run in that case. Another thing that you find in concurrent collections are blocking queues. You've seen blocking queues before. We've talked about blocking queues when we discussed how to implement things like the array blocking queue or the link blocking queue that are all part of the uh, Java concurrent collections framework. And as you can see, there's actually a whole pile of these things. So there's um, array blocking queue, link blocking queue, something called synchronous queue, which you, you used in your program to pass into the, the thread pool executor. And uh, they have you know, various implementation properties and so on and so forth. OK, so I think that is the overview of Java synchronized and concurrent collections.